good morning and again if uh, if you can't find a seat there's plenty of room downstairs um, my name's Richard Quartz. I'm a member of your uh, alumni board here at Terry and uh, chair of the Terry Third Thursday Task Force. Um, if this is your first time here this morning, this is uh, the University of Georgia Terry College's Executive Education Center and uh, our home in Atlanta. And uh, if you'd like a tour, uh, Jill or one of her team would be happy to show you around. It's a great facility and uh, we're very proud of it. Uh, I want to start off with our sponsor recognition. Um, and uh, uh, ironically enough, our premier corporate sponsor this year is Bank of North Georgia. I think we have a, a number of guests from Bank of North Georgia here this morning. I'm not going to call them out, out by name, but I do want to recognize two individuals. Um, Kessel Stelling, who is uh, really the instrumental uh, board member, Terry College board member, who was instrumental in securing Bank of North Georgia as our uh, sponsor. And uh, Don Howard is here. Don is chairman of the Bank of North Georgia and CEO of Synovus Atlanta Region. Um, Don and Kessel, will you want to introduce Don and Kessel? Um, thanks for being here. I also want to uh, introduce our newest uh, corporate sponsor, Deloitte. Um, Ed Hayes and Jeff Paul are here. Thank you, guys. Um, Ed is also a member of our alumni board, and we appreciate your partic participation there. Um, finally, our two media sponsors, from the Atlanta Business Chronicle, we have uh, Shelly. Where is Shelly? Shelly, um, thank you. Um, as you know, uh, Bill Chandler was uh, very dedicated to uh, Terry Third Thursday, and we appreciate all his participation. And look forward to seeing you uh, in the future. And we'll miss uh, we'll miss uh, Bill, but he's uh, been promoted. So, uh, Shelly, thank you for your uh, participation this morning, and always from uh, Public Broadcasting Atlanta. We have Harriet Hoskins Aberhall, and uh, Harriet, I think you might have some comments this morning. As usual, yes. Thanks for with me. Good morning, everybody. Welcome back, George. <laughs> it's so wonderful to see you. Um, and on behalf of the Business Chronicle, who are good friends of ours, um, just in case you hadn't noticed, there are lots of Business Chronicles outside, I believe, on the, uh, maybe they're for somebody else, but there are a bunch of them outside. <laughs> <laughs> On the, on the counter. Um, just a couple of things from public broadcasting. You will have heard at the last financial meeting, type meeting that we've had here that uh, WABE and WPBA and online have been doing a lot of work on investment fraud. A couple of results for you. <clears throat> you can see all the topics that we've covered online at pba.org slash IPT, Investor Protection Trust being our funder. Um, the straight li fraud line that we've been um, promoting on WABE has increased, it's more than doubled its calls in three months. So we hope we're having a, an impact there. And most important, we have 13 in-depth news reports from WABE, which are now on CD. So if there's anybody who'd like those, they cover a variety of subjects from a different approaches by different, seven different reporters. They really are pretty riveting, and they're not particularly time sensitive. Um, although internet scams in particular seem to arise every day. Um, this is a reflection, these reports, of our increasing numbers and uh, caliber of our newsroom. So you can expect to hear more local news, more good, in-depth, impartial local news coming out of WAB in the near future. And lastly, um, we have an organization attached to WABE called StoryCorps. Um, which is collecting stories from around the country and archiving them for posterity. They open in Atlanta today with a special mission of collecting African-American stories, particularly from World War II and the Civil War. So if you know anybody who'd like to contribute to that, uh, get in touch with us and uh, we'll set you in the right direction. They are located at the Martin Luther King National Historic Site. Thank you. Thank you, Harriet. And uh, again, thank you to all our sponsors who make it uh, possible for us to put these programs on. Uh, just a couple more uh, uh, announcements. I want to quickly let you know about uh, our speakers uh, that are coming up in Mar on March 15th. We have John Van Vlesingen. Um, John is chairman of BCD Holdings. Um, that doesn't mean a lot to most of you, but BCD Holdings owns Park and Fly, um, BCD Travel, um, as well as a number of other 
institutions outside of Atlanta, but it's, it, John's a great guy. He's a senior international executive lecturer at the Terry College. Uh, he lives part-time in Atlanta and part-time in the Netherlands, so we're excited to have John on uh, the 15th of March. Then on April 19th, Taylor Glover, uh, president and CEO of Turner Enterprises, will be here. Uh, Taylor was scheduled for last year and unfortunately had to cancel, so we're excited to have him back. As many of you will know, uh, Taylor has had a long uh, friendship and business relationship with Ted Turner, um, so I'm sure uh, Taylor will have some great stories for us. It's never an, a dull moment around Ted. Um, you can register for uh, this, these events online, and we uh, uh, encourage you also to get an annual membership. Uh, it saves you a little bit of money and, and uh, helps us as well. So a uh, couple more announcements. Uh, and Robert Copeland uh, would kill me if I didn't uh, mention this one. The Alumni Board is hosting our Terry College Alumni Awards Gala. It's uh, on May 5th at the West End Buckhead. Uh, it's right across Lenox Square Mall. Um, it's going to be a great night uh, of honors and entertainment. Uh, we'll have our Alumni Awards. Uh, Bill Griffin, Managing Director of Fidelity National Information Services. Uh, Jamie Reynolds, a real estate developer, Reynolds Plantation and uh, our young alum, Allison uh, Carl O'Kelly, uh, CEO of MomCore, uh, as well as Earl Leonard, uh, retired VP from Coca-Cola, will be our recipients this year. Uh, the gala portion of the Alumni Awards will be uh, a live and silent auction with some great, great auction items uh, going up for bids. So if you uh, would like any information on attending that or being a sponsor or providing uh, Auction, autumn, auction items, uh, Jill can help you out, or uh, Robert Copeland, who's in the back. Um, please see those folks. Um, let me ask all the members of the alumni board to stand real quick. We've got our alumni board meeting immediately after this uh, uh, Terry Third Thursday. These guys are, are a tremendous help, um, and we appreciate all their participation. Uh, that will be downstairs um, immediately preceding Terry Third Thursday. Um, let's see. Well, I'm going to go ahead and introduce Kessel. Kessel uh, uh, is a, a member of our alumni, alumni board, uh, and he's going to introduce our speaker this morning. He's been on the board since 2005. He's a 1978 finance graduate of Terry. Um, this past December, he was promoted to CEO of the Bank of North Georgia from his previous position of president and COO. He came to Bank of North Georgia by uh, the way of Riverside Bank uh, in Cobb, which was acquired uh, by Bank of North Georgia about a year ago. Uh, if you haven't guessed it already, Bank of North Georgia is one of about 40 different banks under the Snovis umbrella. And uh, with that, I'm going to let Kessel introduce our speaker this morning. Thank you, Richard, and it is a uh, pleasure to be here this morning uh, on behalf of Bank of North Georgia to introduce our guest speaker, and I want to welcome all of you to this great crowd. I told George Benson earlier, I don't know if the crowd turned out for George's coming back party or Richard's speech, but uh, it's a great crowd, and we really do appreciate you being here. I do want to just add a personal thanks to George for coming back. You know, George accepted the presidency of uh, the College of Charleston this past fall, and uh, we had a series of receptions for him. and. I don't know that he's realized his mistake yet, but he is back after <laughs> after only, I think, two days or, or a couple of weeks, two weeks on the job in Charleston. So thank you for coming back, George. And I know George has uh, a lot of respect for Richard and what he's done and wanted to hear, hear that speech. I also wanted to um, welcome our new uh, sponsor partners, Deloitte and Ed Hayes. Ed and I are old fraternity brothers from Georgia, and, and we love associating with fine companies like that. So Ed, thank you for um, what you do for the Terry College. And now that I've given you a commercial, I want to give myself one. Um, I just want to say that Bank of North Georgia really does take a lot of pleasure in sponsoring the Terry Third Thursday Breakfast. We are about 20 offices in Metro Atlanta with over $4 billion in assets. And Atlanta is very important, not just to Bank of North Georgia, but to Synovus and all of our subsidiaries. So we are um, pleased to be a part of this. We believe very much in giving back to the communities we serve. We're happy to do this with the Terry college and if you haven't met a bank of north georgia banker today you're not trying hard enough so as you leave today um, uh, shake a hand and uh, we'd love to talk to you about how we might um, help you uh, with your uh, with your banking needs uh, let me turn to the introduction now of our of our guest speaker um, 
Richard Anthony is chairman and CEO of Synovus, and a lot of people have talked about Richard and that he had some pretty, pretty big um, shoes to fill. Um, he did, um, but Richard began his career with Synovus through an acquisition of his bank, uh, first commercial bank in Birmingham back in uh, 1992 when he joined the Synovus family, and he became president of the Synovus uh, Bank in Alabama. Um, in 1995, he became vice chairman of Synovus and assumed responsibility for all of the banks in the Synovus system. In 2003, he was promoted to president and chief operating officer of the company and um, our vice chairman, Randy Carroll. And I want to recognize Randy because he's a Georgia Tech graduate wearing a red and black tie. So y'all, <laughs> y'all, now it's a Synovus tie. He's doing that for Richard, not for me. but. Uh, <laughs> But when Richard assumed that role, he also assumed the role of, uh, of interim CEO of the Atlanta region. And Randy still says today it was that training. I'm not sure who trained who, but it was that training that then launched Richard to his lofty heights of uh, chief, ex chief executive officer, uh, officer of the company. And then in this past October was elected chairman of the board and chief executive officer of, uh, of Synovus Corporation. Um, Richard has too many awards and involvements for me to mention. Many of you might have seen him on the in the Wall Street Journal yesterday in an ad touting the University of Alabama. Now, Richard, I would never say, say this, but Ed Hayes earlier today said, you know, there were only two people they could have featured, um, Richard Anthony and Bill Battle, and they're both here today. So, um, <laughs> but that was a great, great uh, ad and a great testament to your achievements as, uh, as, as CEO of Synovus, and we welcome the Alabama connection here today. Again, Richard's been very involved in civic activities, both through the Columbus Chamber of Commerce, the Georgia Chamber of Commerce. He chaired the United Way of the Chattahoochee Valley last year and again has received um, awards too numerous to mention. On a personal note though, I do want to tell you a little bit about the Richard that I have, have learned to know. And I, I talk to Richard off and on. Have to be careful about using dates because the accountants will say we didn't disclose it right, Ed. But several years about um, discussions about merging our company, Riverside Bank, with Synovus and had lots of dinners and discussions with Richard. And Richard never challenged me about the quality of my bank's earnings or the quality of the balance sheet or, or can you really do this in Atlanta. What he really wanted to know was tell me about your um, style of attracting and retaining people. Tell me about your commitment to your employees. Tell me about your commitment to your customers and how you believe in serving them. Tell me about your commitment to your communities. And I think that really does define Synovus and it defines Richard Anthony's style of leadership. He's quickly put his style of servant leadership on our company, um, his passion for excellence, his commitment to our employees, to our customers, to our communities is being felt throughout our company. He has quickly uh, made a name for himself as the leader of our company and a great leader of our industry in this country. So please join me in welcoming Richard Anthony. Kessel, thank you very much. I have looked forward to this opportunity, and I appreciate very much the invitation. Let me first say about Kessel Stelling uh, that uh, Kessel Stelling and Don Howard, who are down there sitting together, have to me been a case study in leadership uh, as they have brought two banks together, which, as you can appreciate, often does not happen successfully because of cultural differences uh, and just uh, the integration challenges uh, that happen in the business world. But uh, they have become great partners. Uh, Kessel is a wonderful leader in our company. Uh, we're flattered to have him on our leadership team. And uh, Don, we thank you for the partnership that has been formed here. Uh, you'll hear me talk about Synovus, and you'll hear me talk about our opportunities and priorities, but at the top of that list is Atlanta, Georgia, uh, because of the tremendous uh, opportunities in business and in banking that uh, exist here and that will continue through the growth uh, that will happen in this most important market uh, in the southeast over the next 20 years. So uh, we're very much committed uh, to our investment here, and we will continue to make investments in people uh, and facilities and in programs. In my time in Georgia, I have become a great admirer of the University of Georgia. Kessel mentioned the University of Alabama, and Bill Battle and I were reminiscing uh, about uh, some of the days there in the past. Uh, 
But the University of Georgia sets the standard in so many ways and has become such a popular university for the best and brightest students that I do actually when I go back and I'm involved in committees and boards at the University of Alabama try to take the ideas that I see here that have been so successful and pass them on. Uh, we, we think we're having success at the University of Alabama but I think Probably the uh, the thing we're most most, for, most noted for today in setting the standard would be in head football coach compensation. Uh, so my only advice to you is give your football coach a raise. I think he deserves it. Uh, four million a year uh, certainly will make him happier than he is today. But you got a great football coach, uh, no doubt about it. <laughs> And George Benson has done so many wonderful things here with the Terry College that we have uh, noticed. Uh, we're the beneficiary in Synovus because we do have uh, a number of graduates. We continue to try and be close uh, to the business school at the University of Georgia because the people uh, commitment that we have in the company uh, is very compatible uh, with the product that is produced. Uh, at the Terry College at the University of Georgia. I want to spend my time with you really uh, talking about three different areas. You'll hear those woven through my comments. Uh, the, the first uh, of these areas uh, would be the differentiators uh, that we have, the, we, we think we have, we'd like to have in Synovus. Secondly would be the strategy uh, of Synovus. And then thirdly would be the people practices in our company. As still a relatively new CEO, and Kessel mentioned my succeeding Jimmy Blanchard, which was a, a wonderful honor and opportunity for me, that transition actually officially took place uh, almost two years ago, mid-year 2005. Uh, so I've been the CEO since that time, and I'm frequently asked uh, what what is most important to you when you go to bed at night? What do you think most about? Uh, and, and I guess my answer this morning is that, first of all, there are two givens, but I think about them a lot. And one of those uh, would be in just the day-to-day -day business practices, credit quality. If you're in the banking business and we substantially make our money, not completely, but uh, uh, Seventy percent of our bottom line comes from financial services and banking. Credit quality has got to be at the top of the list there. Uh, and then secondly would be maintaining integrity throughout our organization. We all know what has happened in the business world in recent years and the blemishes that we all have had to, to really kind of fight our way through, but uh, our company has a reputation for doing things with integrity, and it's my job to continue that. But those, those are givens. Those are sort of the price of admission uh, into our company. And, and really, from a strategic standpoint, what I feel most challenged to do is to have an ongoing plan that will create the kind of growth in our company that will set us apart for years to come, as we have been able to do, actually, for the past 30 years. We have had, I'm proud to say, a very enviable record of achieving uh, consistent and high levels of growth that have set us apart in our industry, and year in and year out, we have been able to perform at a level of about the top three or four financial services companies, uh, in particularly that regional bank space throughout the country. So having a growth plan that will sustain itself and stand the test of time is something I feel like I need to think a lot about because that is not a given. When I took over my new responsibilities, the first thing we really did as an executive group was to thrust ourselves into a more intense series of strategic planning sessions than we had ever done before. And I'll tell you a little about those, but at the outset, we identified four uh, differentiators uh, that we think would provide the foundation for the plan itself. 
as we put meat on the bones in, in this strategic exercise. Now, the first separator that we have, we've had uh, for about 30 years, and, and really for 24 years, it's been a separate company within Synovus, and that is TESIS. This is this large payments company that we have, which is uh, one of the two largest credit card processing companies in the world. And TESIS has had a compounded growth rate in excess of 22% since it was spun out as a separate subsidiary company in 1983. So that has been a wonderful growth engine, an unparalleled success story, in my opinion, in American business. And we've been fortunate to have that underpinning behind the rest of the company. Secondly would be the model itself in Synovus. Now, the model in Synovus is something that we are passionate about but it is an anomaly in the banking world today. We still, from an old-fashioned standpoint, maintain separate charters. We have 40 of those. We operate in what we call a dual branding uh, approach and style, meaning that the Synovus brand is a brand, but the real driver of our brand in a given market, just like the Bank of North Georgia, is that community bank brand. So we work hard to preserve that. We do get challenged on it because it would have the appearance of creating some extra layer of expense that other companies have eliminated. Now we think that we have done a pretty darn effective job in taking out the expense because many uh, possible overlaps uh, have been uh, eliminated, particularly if those are invisible to the customer. Decentralization is the theme in Synovus. Empowerment at the local level, and this has to translate to be successful into a level of responsiveness that separates us from our competitors. We do empower our bankers to own the customer relationship, to manage the credit decision-making process, and everything that we do really has the look of the community bank personalized service approach instead of the big bank approach. Now, we are a big bank. We're $32 billion in assets, but we really believe in the power of small teams. We believe in acting like we are small, and yet we still do capitalize on the expertise, the capital, the resources, the product array, that a large financial services company would be expected to have. So we are constantly trying to manage this company to be the best of two different worlds, the community bank delivery and the big bank expertise and sophistication and strength uh, that our size and performance track record brings with us. The third differentiator has evolved over time. It has not always been there for Synovus, and it has to do with the markets themselves. Kessel mentioned that I came into the company in 1992, uh, and I did. And, and I remember reading some of those investment research reports about our company at that time, which stated that Synovus uh, is a more of a small town community banking organization that has no desire to compete with the big regional banks in the bigger markets. And, and in fact, Atlanta was the market most frequently mentioned. We, we did not have a presence really in Atlanta of any significance until the late 90s. And yes, we did shy away from the bigger southeastern markets, and we were more comfortable in the relatively small sort of second and third tier communities. But over time, we began to realize that this model that I'm talking about worked just as effectively in a bigger market than it does in a smaller community. So we started to make investments. In fact, I came from one of those, Birmingham, Alabama, that Kessel mentioned. Uh, and we've had great success there with nearly a $2 billion asset uh, size bank today. So over time, 
we've taken our company from a position of, say, 15% of our banking assets in the early 90s in the smaller markets, 15%, uh, let me state that a different way, 15% of our banking assets in the early 90s were in these bigger growth markets, those that promised uh, potential like an Atlanta or a Nashville or a Birmingham. Uh, today, that 15% has grown to a percentage north of 60%. So we have redeployed the company. We have made acquisitions in the better southeastern markets, and we have pulled away from some of the smaller markets. We sold three banks. Uh, we actually have uh, consolidated or closed uh, probably 30 or 40 uh, branches. In fact, we sold 20 of those over about a five or six year period of time as we repositioned the company for growth. So we believe in the, the demographic mix, the size, the population, the, the business activity that comes with a presence in a bigger market in the southeast. Our coastal community presence down the east coast of the, of the Atlantic uh, is, uh, is also uh, very thorough. Uh, we've had a lot of growth there, similarly in the Panhandle and now in Florida. We're in five states, uh, and Florida is probably still at the top of our list for expansion opportunities. So the markets, we think, set us apart, and the southeast in general, as we all know because we live here, stands out well uh, comparing us to our peers. And then the fourth differentiator would be the people side of the company. Kessel mentioned that. We have been fortunate to enjoy a reputation that I'm proud of. We've been listed in the Fortune uh, list of 100 companies produced annually, thought to be the best places to work in America. We were number one one year. Uh, there's a lot of competition for recognition in this space, uh, but we try to do something tangible every year to make our company a more attractive place to work and enjoy a successful career. So those would be the four differentiators. Now let me shift to our strategy and how that development capitalizes on this foundation that I have mentioned. First, a little about the process. We were determined early on to make this not an exercise that produced a document that would go on the shelf that we could check off the list with our regulators. We want this to be a document uh, that is a live document. We refer to it frequently. It has action steps uh, in it with timelines that we constantly measure ourselves against. We were a lot more interested in the how rather than the what. It's easy to say what you're going to do. It's easy to produce a financial plan, but a strategic plan that has uh, a lot of action in it that is driven around how you manage activities to get to the results really can be an effective uh, document for your executive team and the people throughout the company. Uh, so those were very uh, important. Our executives were engaged. I think many good things came from the interaction that took place over a series of months. We ended up with five high-level elements. I'm going to concentrate on one uh, more than the others briefly so you can understand how it connects to the model. I mentioned the model, the decentralization, uh, the multiple charters, uh, but if there's any segment out there in the banking customer base and target market opportunities that this responsive model appeals to is the small and medium-sized business. Now, we're never going to be the greatest retail bank in the world. We'll be a good one uh, because there are others that have a bigger brand, more coverage with branches, uh, really, and, uh, and, and, and ATM facilities, etc. But the business community likes to see a banker that gives quick response on credit that can become a trusted advisor, a partner uh, at the table uh, that is so integral to their future that we have recommitted ourselves in this plan to becoming what we aspire to, what we want to be, 
and our aspiration is to become the premier commercial bank in the southeast. Commercial bank meaning the middle market, the private business, sales five to 25 to 50 million dollars. That's the sweet spot for Synovus. That's where we're trying to really rededicate ourselves. Now I say rededicate because commercial real estate has been so strong in all of our markets in recent years that our dependency on that as a driver for earning assets and revenue has constantly gone up. Not totally a bad thing, but too much of a dependency to suit us. So we want to become more diversified, and the diversification opportunity comes more from this middle market segment, the commercial business that is going to have far more relationship opportunities than a commercial real estate customer who is going to be more transactional in nature. There's more cyclicality to commercial real estate. Sure, the yields are high, but we're trying very hard in managing the outcome of our strategic effort to one of more balance and more diversification. We also are stressing the integration of these specialty areas that as we have become larger, we have invested in. The wealth management business, which we call financial service, financial management services is very important to us. We have asset-based lending, we have leasing, we have a mortgage banking subsidiary, we have a capital markets group that joined us from South Trust two and a half years ago that brings a lot of expertise uh, that we can apply to our customer needs. Uh, so integration of these specialty areas in a more profitable manner is very much uh, desired on our part. The market expansion that I mentioned will continue. Uh, acquisitions are a line of business in our company. We still like community banks uh, that are not huge, uh, but uh, perhaps uh, six, seven, eight hundred million dollars in size and asset size, maybe a billion uh, with a good management team, just like Riverside was, is, is, is the target for us in acquisitions. And we do mix some de novo activity in. We have started some new banks from scratch in Jacksonville, Florida, and Augusta, uh, Georgia, and Savannah, Georgia, and in Chattanooga in recent years. We want to be an innovator. Uh, it's harder uh, to create a thesis. Maybe we'll never create another thesis, but we have an emerging business opportunity uh, component uh, in our strategic planning conclusions. And then the people practices, and I'll come back to that in just a second. But the theme throughout all of this is balance and diversification, certainly contributing to the growth. Now. Lastly, let me shift to something that really is so deeply ingrained in our culture uh, in Synovus, and that has to do with people and leadership. In, in all of our expansion, we're, we're buying, uh, when we make an acquisition, not bricks and mortar and customers nearly as much as we are acquiring people and executives and leaders that will be committed long-term to the future of Synovus. We have a leadership institute that we're very proud of, and many of my colleagues in the room, if not all, have participated in that. I'm, I'm uh, pleased with, with the results that it generates in our company uh, to further the culture and help us hone the leadership skills that are so important. But I have four quick thoughts on people and leadership uh, that I will pass on and would like to share with you this morning. First of all, the old command and control style, in my opinion, is basically out today in American business. It is not effective. It might be effective in some situations, certain short-term opportunities where it might fit, but the hierarchical approach, the top-down a style of management uh, really is much less effective than one of collaboration, one of partnering. Uh, we have a lot of silos in our company, but we stress very much 
collaboration and partnerships that cross those lines. We believe very much in team member engagement. Uh, a thousand little brains are going to get you a lot more than one big brain in a company. I can promise you that. And uh, it's my job every day to create engagement from the thousands of people that work in Synovas. We do tend to build consensus perhaps more uh, than others. Uh, that can be carried too far because decisiveness uh, is still important in any business and its ability to react. Secondly, servant leadership, uh, which was mentioned. Uh, we really strongly believe in that. It really fits in with what I said about the command and control being out. Uh, the notion of supporting others uh, is so important. If you think about your own career, in the early years, a person is most interested in becoming recognized and raising their hand to take on additional responsibilities uh, and in individual performance. But to be truly successful over a career as a leader, the success of others drives a leader's success. So there, there will come for each person a turning point uh, when all of a sudden you're not thinking nearly as much as what you do and how you personally can be successful, but how can you make others successful? And we spend a lot of time talking about how to do that uh, in our jobs as leaders and managers in Synovus. People want their opinions to count, and I think servant leadership really supports that desire. Thirdly is the idea of work having meaning beyond the bottom line. One thing I learned from Jimmy Blanchard early on was that to really connect with people, you had to do more than just talk about the numbers, the profits that were coming really for us uh, uh, very nicely on a regular basis. But people want to feel good about their work. They want to feel like their work makes a difference, that it affects and improves the lives of others. And we can break that into really three different categories. First, the communities. We do support our communities in every market in which we compete. We encourage that. We encourage it financially. We encourage it from a time uh, standpoint. Uh, and, and so communities are important. Certainly, we believe that in our business, if we can make our customers' financial lives successful, if we can sell our products not on a product pushing basis or living from one campaign to the next, but on a needs basis, identifying needs that truly are legitimate so that we can fit our products to the needs of our customers, then we will make them successful. And if you're trying to embark uh, in, in a sales management activity, you're going to get a lot more engagement from your sales force if they believe they're helping people rather than pushing something on them that they don't really need. And then the idea of just helping each other be successful certainly uh, is a part of work having meaning beyond the bottom line. Unfortunately, we all know that a lot of companies have sold their souls for profits. They have taken shortcuts. They have done things that really uh, I think undermined uh, the culture in their companies. I believe the business community has learned from those highly publicized mistakes, uh, and we certainly have paid attention and want to do our part to create this uh, connection uh, for work having the meaning uh, that we expect beyond profitability. And then the last point to make, uh, has to do with leadership and engaging both the heart and the mind. I'm reminded, and I wrote this down, of a quote that came from Abraham Lincoln in one of the Lincoln-Douglas debates in which he said, in order to win men to your cause, you must first reach his heart. And there's so much truth to that. Uh, if you're trying to build trust, uh, if you're trying to build confidence uh, as a leader, uh, you have to engage the heart as well as the mind. So we all know that just about anybody can sell the same products that we sell. 
Uh, we're reminded of that every day. I, I guess we're all to some degree in a commodity business of sorts. We all look for our differentiators, just as we do in Synovus, to provide the foundation for our growth strategy. But at the end, it's the people that make the difference, and you have to take care of your people uh, to really get the full uh, impact of that resource that we have at our fingertips. And I feel that that is going to be my, be my ongoing responsibility uh, in my days ahead as the CEO of Synovus. So I thank you for listening to me. I thank you for being here. I really appreciate the invitation to be with such a fine institution I admire so much. I look forward to my close relationship uh, in the days ahead. Uh, and I will now pause and see if there are questions. I hope there are. I'd be happy to entertain them. I'm, I'm going to uh, ask that we uh, use the microphone for the purposes of uh, recording the questions for our webcast. So uh, do we have any questions for uh, Richard? Yes, ma'am. Uh, you talked about servant leadership, and I've been so admiring of what Sinovus has been able to do in that area and beyond. How do you see you can really be able to expand that whole idea so that it becomes more pervasive throughout the business community in the United States? Well, I think, I, I feel like there's, there's some momentum there, but I really don't hear that term uh, expressed nearly as much by outsiders as, as we do. Uh, I think uh, by having um, opportunities to tell the story, uh, I think our Leadership Institute uh, creates a, a great following of that style of, uh, of management and, and leadership, but uh, uh, I don't know that there's any single answer, but you, if, if, if I think a company has to be successful uh, in its performance to create the credibility for its leadership style. So if the company can back up uh, what it says with, uh, with, with good financial results that are consistent over a long period of time, I really think that's the kind of company that draws attention to the style of leadership that it espouses. Uh, so if we see more and more truly successful companies that are willing to talk about openly the servant leadership concept, I think it will gain even more traction throughout the business community. Anyone else have a question? Have one over here. Yes, sir. Hi, you, uh, you mentioned that there were some specific things you did every year to keep uh, the bank uh, a good place to work. Can you give some examples of those things? Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you asked that because I, I really skipped over it and made the, the general statement. The first thing that we do, that we've started to do every year, and we didn't always do it, is we do a very comprehensive survey uh, of all of our team members. And I'm proud to say for the last couple that we've done, uh, we've had right at a 90% response rate. So you get a good sense of, of the, the, the feelings that uh, exist out there in your workforce. Not only do they fill out the survey, uh, but you get pages and pages of anecdotal statements and comments, and sometimes there are trends and patterns there in addition to the survey results. Now, the survey itself has been driven in large part by the Great Place to Work Institute, and we became familiar with it through the uh, application process 10 years ago that we started uh, to uh, compete for recognition with the fortune list. So we get the survey results, and then uh, we ha our executives and, 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 and really a team of people uh, dig deeply into that, and there are certain trends and patterns and findings. And usually each year we can, we can isolate the most important uh, trends down to about three areas of perhaps weakness that we feel exist in the company. It might be you know, it might be compensation, you know, fairness in 
uh, promoting and rewarding people for good performance. Uh, this past year, uh, there seemed to be a strong desire for better uh, two-way communication uh, in our company. If you're going to have servant leadership, uh, servant leadership, by the way, uh, is most evident not necessarily at the top of the company, but down at the supervisor team member level. If you, you've got to have a good, healthy environment at, at, at that level in any company, which means you've got to have good two-way communication there to be functional and healthy. But we take these trends and, and patterns that come from the survey, and uh, we, if there are three areas of opportunity, then we'll create cross-functional teams headed by a leader in our company. Uh, for example, this past year, uh, uh, our Athens First CEO, Bill Douglas, who's a great leader in our company, headed up the, uh, the study group. And they met a number of times and came up with recommendations. And then we talked publicly and openly about what we're going to do at the operating unit level and throughout the company to address these areas of weakness. So that's, that's what I'm trying to say is that we react in a tangible way to what we hear coming from our team members uh, more through the survey than any other source of information. But I feel if you don't do something every year to move in this direction of continuous improvement, then you certainly as you can appreciate, stand the risk of going backward. Anybody else? Yes, sir. Risk, um, but I'm wondering if you have so many different corporate entities, and they uh, are individually. Uh, of running their own show, how do you right. monitor credit risk on a total basis and how do you keep that credit risk under control in this accelerating, declining market that we right. have now? If I were a person learning about our company and studying our model, that, that question would probably be about the first one to pop into my mind. I would say, okay, I hear you, and decentralization sounds great, but it can make uh, risk management more of a challenge. If you're empowering more than others down to the front line, uh, how do you avoid the mistakes that can come from that? And certainly there is a bit more uh, risk, but I, I'll say that over the last five or six years, uh, we have, uh, and Don can testify in Kessel too, we, we've put more uh, teeth in our corporate risk management uh, system. We, we have a corporate loan administration group that comes in and, and studies uh, and, and analyzes the portfolio of each individual bank, uh, much like a bank examiner would, and they provide a report. Uh, we've got different layers uh, involved in risk management. The bank itself has its own credit apparatus, and then at the corporate level we have one too, and we obviously uh, when I say empowerment, each bank can grant credit up to their own legal lending limit, which is driven by their own capital structure. So it's not unlimited. And if a smaller bank wants to provide large credit to a, a business, they have to have the, uh, the other layers of approval uh, weigh in on that. So I, I, I guess if I were to compare our company's risk management in the credit area today to what it was six or seven years ago, I would say there clearly is more oversight. And I'll, I'll, sh I'll just share this with you. About four years, three and a half years ago, the regulators, uh, it was the Federal Reserve, came in and they wanted to meet with me. And uh, they said, we just, we think you've got an outstanding company. We, we don't, we don't really have major concerns about what we're seeing, but we we know that your decentralized model has been tried before, and there have been many others that came before you that eventually had to abandon it because of primarily risk management mistakes. And they said, we don't want you to succumb to those same pressures. 
And they said, what we think you need is not a change in the model, but you need to centralize the information flow in a better way so at least you at the top of the company can understand your company better as a single enterprise uh, than you currently do today. And it made an impact on me. And so we didn't change the model, but there is more extensive reporting today. And we do understand our company today as a single enterprise. And of course, the whole board governance uh, situation is, is more demanding for various reasons that we all know about. So, uh, so we have, we, we, and when we do something like that, we try to do it in a way that keeps the balance acceptable for the energy level of our bankers and our CEOs at the local level. So they're having to report more, but they still have got their own bank to run and their own identity uh, and their own team to create results at that community bank level. Yes? Given the insignificant rate of savings for Americans as a whole, um, at an enterprise level, what sense of responsibility do you feel your organization has to help influence change in that area? With just um, consumer behavior and attitudes and education. And, and planning for the future. Planning, yeah. Well, we, uh, I think the whole shift of, you know, the, the transfer of wealth that's taking place in this country has created some dynamics that have, have caused us to want to, uh, to shift away from just being basically a community banker that excels at lending and deposit gathering, but to be more comprehensive in the services that we offer. And, and, and one of those, in fact, uh, with Buzz Law, my uh, colleague over here, is financial planning. And uh, I mean, there, 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 is a, there is a lot to be done, I think, within financial services uh, to, uh, to shift over into the investment uh, uh, of, of, of assets and providing opportunities uh, for people on the investment and saving side as opposed to just being driven by the lending opportunities that really have contributed more to our profitability. So our whole financial management services strategy that was rolled out in a big way six or seven years ago, I think recognizes that this pool of money out there uh, needs uh, uh, attention, that, that many of our customers uh, have got needs that we were unable to meet. And it occurs even down at the, it, we, we start down at the, uh, at the mass market level, and they need advice on mutual funds and investments other than just certificates of deposit. And we move up to the emerging uh, wealthy, and, and then we move up to the more affluent segments. So our financial management services strategy, I think, addresses that. Could you use the model that ING and, and um, financial institutions like that with the higher interest rates that they're paying, is that, in, it's more or less an online approach in a way, is that going to influence you in the future, or do you have a plan for that? Are you aware of that it, it competition? Will. It will influence us, um, and uh, we, um, in other words, the, the bricks and mortar approach is a more expensive way to, to gather funding um, because there's a lot of investment that comes with it, and and the uh, you know the internet uh, capability and deposit gathering that occurs there is certainly a competitive force that we will have to contend with, and it's. It's showing up today. I, I would say today, as we enter 2007, the biggest headwind that we are contending with is this margin management, which has to do with uh, competing forms of deposit. Some of these deposit gatherers are able, apparently, to pay more interest than, than we have been willing to pay. Uh, and so we have to react to that. And we'll have to look at our channels. I think there'll always be a place for the bricks and mortar branch approach, but the, uh, uh, the online channel is something that we continue to invest in, but we don't rely nearly like others do 
in that form of funding. So yeah, our industry uh, is having to contend with that and, uh, and we all are talking about the pressure we feel on our margin this year. Some of that is the inverted yield curve. Uh, the inverted yield curve makes it tough uh, because you're, you, you're gathering deposits uh, paying short-term interest rates, but some of your lending and investment activities go out on the yield curve where the, where the returns are less. So that too is a factor, but competitive forces um, are there and, uh, and we'll just have to offer more channels and you know, funding is going to be here as a challenge for the banking industry going forward. Well, I thank you for your attention and your questions. I've enjoyed it. Kessel, uh, or Kessel, uh, Richard, I don't want you to sit down quite yet. We have a, uh, a piece of artwork here that's uh, uh, a piece of hand-blown glass, hand -blown glass uh, done by Paul Bendazunas in Athens, and we want to give you that. And uh, again, thank you for uh, your time this morning and imparting <coughs> such wonderful wisdom on us. Thank you as well. <laughs> don't forget... Uh, Terry, third Thursday is all you need to say when you're leaving the parking de deck, and that uh, that gets you out for free. Um, in March, we'll have John Van Vlesingen, uh, and uh, we want to thank you for coming, and we're adjourned. <laughs>